Hey guys, welcome back to the Steel Forum. Today we've got our kind of very, very, uh, at this point I have to even add a third very late response to the uh, STS2 Users Group Conference. We'll be talking about some of the things that we experienced there, some of the things we learned, uh, both in the sessions and out of the sessions as far as what's coming up for SDS2 in 2020. There are a lot of exciting developments there that we'll talk about. Uh, talk about some of the people that we met and some exciting conversations that we had about the future of Steel Decon. All that today on the Steel Forum. All right, guys, welcome back to the Steel Forum. Today we are having the beginning of our long lost conversations about our trip to the SDS2 Users Group Conference. If you are not an SDS2 user, you're probably not going to be particularly interested in this episode. Uh, that being said, there is a lot interesting to kind of unpack, so much in fact that I think we're gonna have to do several episodes on it. Uh, the first one, this one, kind of focusing on the, the, the unofficial things that happen at the conference, which are, to me, kind of the most important things that happen at the conference or the conversation that you have with people when you get on the ground. So, uh, Matt, what what did you think overall? Did you have the the quality conversations that you you hoped for? I did. You know, we we met with a lot of people. Some people I was meeting for the first time. Some people I've run into over and over again. It it was kind of a different conference for me. In conferences I've been to in the past, you kind of tend to see the same people over and over. But, you know, this time I met a lot of new people that I haven't seen before. So it was, it was kind of an interesting mix of getting to kind of catch up with old friends and also meet some new people. Yeah. It's um, a, so the, the first night we wound up going down to Laszlo's, right? Uh, a group of people together. Yeah. Yeah. That was the, yeah. First, the first night. Before that, we'd gone with, uh, with uh, Tom Riddle down to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we we saw him right at the airport as we were coming coming in. We yep. ran into him and kind of hung out the. Yeah, we went down to the the Mexican joint there, which, ironically, El Portrero. The, El Portrero is that the name of it? Yep. yep. Look that up. The, so, uh, ironically, in the middle of nowhere, Nebraska is the best Mexican food that I have ever had, and like, I've been to Mexico a couple of times, and this was still far and away some of the best Mexican and the and fantastic margaritas, which. I know you uh, particularly enjoyed. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the recipe myself just so I can have one at home. And I'm not quite there yet. Did you try the one with the limeade yet? No, I wasn't able to find it. Oh, all right. Well, that's... We, but, I, I mean, I, I'm starting off with garbage tequila, so I have to move up from there. But first, I got to drink that bottle before I can justify spending any more. You, you don't have to do that. That's not... You don't have to suffer. Just get the, the good stuff. And what do you for, do with the bad stuff? You just throw it away. Just dump it. It's, if it oh, sucks. It's, it's money, though. It's, I struggle with that. Yeah, but you're chasing bad money anyways. You should know as a detailer when to, yeah. when to let a bad, bad thing go. Well, I was thinking I would just invite some people over and let them drink it all up. There you go. I've got some particularly alcoholic acquaintances that would not Yeah, mind what you want what you cabinet. want for margaritas is neither the best nor the worst tequila. You want something like in the Sansa Gold range mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where it's like this is it, it's okay. And when you add, you know, the limeade and all the other stuff, you'll be good. You'll be good. And it's my uh, my sister and I made a a uh, thermos full of it, a two quart thermos full of it and took it to a Bills game. And, uh, well, she doesn't remember the second half of that game. <laughs> so it was, it was good. Say, how too. did you get home? Yeah. Yeah. We had to sit in, in our tailgate experience for, for quite a few hours after the game. And you can't like, after the first half is over, you can't drink at the game. So that gives you a sense of how long we had to sit before we were sober. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot, of, and speaking of a lot of drink, there's a lot of drinking that goes on at the conference. There's a, there's a young gentleman out there who may still be suffering the effects of, of <laughs> trying to drink me under the table at the, uh, the what, conference dinner. Yeah, yeah, that was... 
<laughs> that was a bit of a challenge. I remember seeing him the next day, and he was he was definitely a whipped puppy. Yeah. The next morning. Yeah, yeah. We went out to lunch with them. We went to the Mexican place again. And he got uh he got chicken soup, and even still, they sat it down in front of him, and he just, no, nope, that's not for me. <laughs> so. <laughs> I just got a, a funny Facebook message. Somebody mistyped the word assess. And well, anyways, uh, so yeah, so we, we talked with Tom and we talked a lot um, at, at lunch about kind of the pricing structure, how much we charge. That's one of the things I'm always surprised by is regionally how widely the, the prices vary. And you know, we, we talk fairly openly about the, the rate that we charge for detailing. And, you know, we're not ashamed of it. And we don't think anybody should be either. Uh, you know, if, just go down to your local mechanic and ask him if he's ashamed of how much he charges per hour. And if he has the yeah. same... Uh, you, you should not be charging less than your local mechanic. Yeah. That's that's at least a, a good starting point right there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, our, our software's not cheap. Our computer systems aren't cheap. Our, you know... Our experience, our right. Our experience is not cheap. It's the old, it's the old adage of like, you know, 25 cent washer is 25 cents, but knowing where to put that washer is 150 bucks. So it's, it, we, we, throughout the conference, throughout, you know, our, our discussions, we talk about people, we try to keep it in, in somewhat, you know, general terms, but you need to be charging appropriately for your work. And as detailers, we owe it to each other. To, to not be undercutting yourself. I know there's still detailers out there who are charging fifty dollars an hour, you know, for their for their change order rate, and that's that's not going to get it done. We've, we've got we have too many expenses, and hiring a detailer is is it's skilled detailer anyways is is also expensive. So go out there get that money. Uh, so we talked a lot about that. We talked about about um, it, change order culture in general, and and how some of our customers are are great about it and they understand is particularly if it's a change order to our customer, we want to know that information versus if they screwed up something in house, for instance, they didn't send us an ASI when maybe they should have, when they had it or, or whatever else. We'll, we'll try to be very helpful with that. As long as on the back end, when there is a change order to them, they're not trying to nickel and dime us out of our change order stack. So there's, there's a give and take to that. Um, and our, our, our good customers kind of appreciate and, and they're, that. Right. The the problem comes in when you get the the fabricator that doesn't want to pass any change order onto their customer, no matter how completely obvious. legitimate that uh, you know and how obvious that change is. You know, if they relevel top of steel, if they shift grid lines and change section sizes, and oh no, I, I don't want to pass any of that onto my customer. We we just eat that. One, I don't know how you're staying in business, but congratulations on that, I guess. And, you know, too, you're really stiffing your, your, your vendors by not allowing them to charge for that or by expecting them to eat that, you know, it's going to make it very hard for you to find an outside detailer to work with in that case. Right. And, and that, you know, something else to think about is if, if you have an in-house staff and they have to redraw that building, you're going to have to pay them to do it. So you're going to pay for that change order, whether you're working with in-house people or with outside people. Right. And there, uh, of course, there is, you know, there's a leeway, right? If you change to 21 by 44 up to a 21 by 50, you know, we're not going to charge you for, for detailing that piece again. If, you know, you screwed up a, a, a single grid, okay, we, we can fix that. We'll, we'll edit it. It's when they've taken the chance at approval to complete their design that that we're looking for stuff and it's basically it's a matter of percentages you know what i mean if it's, it's somewhere in the range of let's say five to ten percent of the project has revisions on approval we'll probably kind of let that go right it's it's the the stuff that all right if i redo this for free it's my entire profit margin it, I, I, I can't more. right or like a, sometimes a lot more you can't do that. And you know, you got to talk to your customers too about, listen, do you really want me to include all of this potential rework in my original bid? Because 
then it's going to all of my prices are going to be higher. Right. Now you risk not getting the job in the first place. Right. And if I don't have to do a change order, you just gave me that money for free. Right. So there's, there's a give and take and everybody should be respectful of it, but they should also be respectful of your time. Just because I'm not, I'm charging you something. I'm not walking away with all of that cash. I have stuff to do with that money. Like I have to pay my bills. I have to pay somebody to, to go through and do that work. So, it, you know, the, the basic rule of thumb is could I have expected this specific dot change looking at the, the, the bid drawings? And if I couldn't have, if I couldn't known that I had to do that work, then there's no way that I could have included in my price. And you wouldn't have wanted me to include it in my price. It's, it's just not a good look, you know, and we have, we have customers too, where they'll say, oh, well, because you phrased that question that way, it means that I can't go get my money because the, the approver had to redesign that thing. No, that is not true. No. If, <laughs> if there's Our no questions do not form part of the contract documents, right? Right. Either it was shown and can be, could have been anticipated on the contract drawings, or it wasn't shown and it's an error and they had to do something else. There's no question that we can ask that says we're going to do it for free. The only way that happens if we can say is if we say this is for our convenience, right? This is to make fabrication easier. We would prefer to do it this way. Then there's some argument to be had that, okay, you did it for your convenience. But if it's because, you know, you framed a W21 by 50 into a W12 by 14, and so you had to upsize that 12 by 14, that's, that's a change order. And everybody should accept it. But we've, we've seen that through a couple customers who are like, well, I don't want to ask the question. And there is, a, there is a finesse to asking questions in such a way to make sure that they understand that this was something they left off their, con, you know, their design documents. But there's there's a line, right? It's right. And posing a, a a suggested solution does not lock you into owning the cost of that solution. Right. You're just attempting to be helpful. That's not, you know, in any way, shape, or form making you liable for the outcome of that. It's ultimately up to the design team to decide what is it we're going to do here instead. And then if that's an increase in price, they have to pay for that. Yeah. Or, or the owner does. However, you know, however that gets reasoned out at the end, but it's not on the fabricator and it's not on the detailer to eat that cost. Right. And that's the project manager's responsibility to take care of. So, uh, you know, but they've, they've got to be honest about it. Um, so that was kind of our, our, our lunch with, with Tom Riddle, but also a conversation that we have kind of consistently through these conferences is, you know, where's, where's your money going? How are you getting it? Um, and that, you know, you, you started to talk about Laszlo. So that was one of the next conversations that I thought was super important. You know, we, we ran into the folks from uh, Tinker Steel Detailing. Mm -hmm. um, and we discussed with them kind of some of the hoops that they've had to jump through to, to get their customers to pay at times. You know, it, right back to kind of the, and this wasn't that long ago, the, the story that they told me about it was, you know, they had to physically go to a fabricator's office with a roll of drawings and okay, you hand me the check and here are your drawings. And it's like, it's so ridiculous. And then it's funny too, cause they, they said the same thing. A lot of these fabricators are like, Oh, I'll never work with you again after this. And it's like, why would you think that I'm going to just because you know, I'm a sub to you does not mean that I'm going to roll over for everything you want. And every work you have is a gift. Lisa, may I have some more? No. No, that is detailers are a demanded product and we are not going to be treated like sure overseas detailers will jump through all kinds of hoops, especially the, the newer ones who are struggling for business, but we know what we're doing. We do it well and we're not, you know, <laughs> not hurting for it. We're not going to just roll over for whatever you say. And if you don't pay us, why would I ever, ever want to work with you again? Right. That's, that's not right. work. That's slavery. I, right. If I can't reasonably expect payment on a job that was completed, then why? You're not a gift. You know, I earned that money and I've, 
if if that's the way you're going to treat you know your your essentially vendors your your suppliers and whatnot then nobody's going to want to work with you right right and that that you know we've talked about it before but a lot of that can be handled by billing appropriately at the you know the right amounts at the right time and we've we've heard a lot of communication too right right we we heard a lot of of a wide range of billing terms, anything from, well, we don't bill anything until it's in for fabrication to when I send the approval drawings, I bill a hundred percent. And it's, it's, that seems to be a regional thing too, because we have, we, we've only ever come across one customer that says, you know, when you submit it for approval, bill me the whole thing outright. And we get a, a, an array of ones that'll tolerate 80% or 90% billing when it goes for approval, some want 50%. It, it, it's kind of all over the place, but they all also think that whatever it is they do, and we come back to this a lot, but whatever it is they do, that's standard. And it's the only way anyone would ever do it. And nobody would ever ex- accept anything other than that. Oh yeah. We, you know, we get, we got into an argument about that recently. You know, one of our customers was talking about, well, we need your, your model file. And it was, you know, we can absolutely send you the model file, but our, our payment terms are set up around, we need most of our payment to be paid before we're giving you our model file. Because it's the equivalent of handing over your, your you know, originals. They can do whatever they want. And this wasn't an established customer who basically we know that their checks are gonna be good, they're gonna come in on time, we don't have to beat them up about it. Um, because in that case, a lot of times we will, we've developed that level of trust. Right. Right. And that's, that's important too. But before that exists, the contract is there for a reason. Here's what we expect and here's what we'll give and and read it. And we're right. You've already negotiated the deliverables for the job and that's all that there is to it. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, that's something you have to watch out for when you're on like a BIM job is what are your deliverables? Because you've got to know exactly what kind of file and what format, you know, and, and what's the order of operations that you're going to submit these in, in order to make the job work properly and to meet your requirements under the contract so that you can get paid. And also so that the job can move along as it's supposed to. Right. And you know, it's the same thing. It, everything is negotiable, but once you've signed that contract, that's it. Those are the terms. And everyone is expected to follow those terms. Right. And if you want to modify it, that's a two-way conversation. You don't just get right. to say, well, right. that's not how I want. Right. Which you, which you can't say once you've got a signed contract to the contrary is, well, all of my other customers do this. All of my other detailers do this. That's nice. They don't have this contract, do they? Right. Right. And again, this is we talk about all the time. But we are not shy about our contract. It's not a long contract. It's one page of terms that say, this is what we're going to deliver. This is when, this is what we expect for payment. And this is when, and these are what happens if any of those things aren't followed. And, you know, we're also too, we make sure that you've read it and that you agree to it. And it's, you know. And if you don't agree to something, we have a discussion about it. It should be negotiated. Yeah. Yeah. And we do that too. You know, we, we've modify our terms all the time when we have a customer that they want a little bit different billing terms, but whatever it is, you have to have that conversation. If you agree to it, then you've agreed to it. You can't change your mind later on and say, well, I know I've signed up for 15 day terms, but I pay everybody on 45 day terms. Oh, well then you're going to find lots of problems when your job is delayed because you're 30 days past due all the time. Right. You know, and- but if you'd had that conversation to begin with, then we could have figured this out. Yeah. Yeah. But through a lot of ways too. like, uh, you know, a lot of times fabricators are like, you know, I'm sorry, you know, that the project manager, but because of the, you know, the way our payables work, there's some, you know, Suzanne up in accounts payable won't pay anything before 30 days. I want her to, but whatever. All right. Well then let's have a discussion about it. Cause then what I'll do is I'll just issue our invoice earlier. You know, yeah. you set, put it in for accounting and then, and then get that out for payment. And then we're still getting paid when we need to be. Um, right. Or alternatively, we can bill a higher amount up front. Right. 
all sorts of stuff that can be negotiated. It's got to come up. It's all negotiable. But you, you, you mentioned that, you know, you think it's kind of regional, but I don't necessarily think it's regional. I think it's, it varies a lot depending on the size and width of the customer base for the details. Because there are a lot of detailing firms, and this is not, you know, in condescension to them, that have one or two customers that they kind of stick with. Right. And a lot of times they are customers that they started with before they really kind of got their business acumen kind of all developed in place. So they've had a handshake agreement that works for them that they've developed that trust for. And mm -hmm. that, that's fine. Now, I, I do have some cautions about that, especially when there is an economic downturn. Right now we're doing pretty well. Um, so most people can pay their bills reasonably on time. But right. when there's a downturn, all of a sudden that stuff starts to become a little bit more important, you know, especially if jobs get canceled, if jobs get delayed, all of those things, you know, when stuff goes bad, it's really, really nice to have that written, signed contract behind whatever it is that you say, um, because convention goes right out the window and lawyers get real, real expensive and real excited when you don't have any clear terms between the two of them. Right. Yeah. Right. In a, in a lawsuit, uh, lawyers win. And that's, yeah. Yeah. that's the long and short of it. Yeah. Um, it, something I want to talk about in the future is we have found a collections firm that works on contingency. Uh, we're still kind of feeling them out to see kind of what they can do. But uh, for those uncollectible bills, you know, what we term as bad debt, um, they're, they're, looking to be an asset to us, um, especially. Well, we've, we've actually got a couple of different things going on. One is a firm that helps you manage the lien laws, especially in a state by state situation. And when you're a subcontract detailer, that's really a, a much bigger issue than you would think because each state has its own lien law rules. So you've got preliminary notices of furnishing, you've got notice of intent to file lien, and then you've got the actual lien. And each state has varying rules on how that's done and what you need to do to actually protect yourself. Yeah, and you could, be, you could have been operating in New York, which has fairly comfortable lien laws for, for subs, and not know that, hey, I'm starting a project in, say, Michigan, Michigan mm -hmm. where you have to have all these things in or your lien rights are completely gone. Yep. And the, the service, I mean, it's relatively cost effective. It's, it's. Well, if you compare the price of the service against even a single back charge, not a back charge. Cause I, I mean, I want to, when I use the word back charge, I want to consider that as a legitimate back charge, but right. when, when a customer sees for, for potentially about to be a former customer sees fit to just stiff you. Yeah because something went wrong on the job and you know, they're just, the, the something has, always been made up, right. right? It's, it's always a thing that never existed until it was time, time to write to the, the check. Yeah. yeah. One of the terms in our contract actually says, you know, listen, if a, if an invoice is past due, there's no back charges on that invoice. You can, yeah. if, if that invoice comes in and you've got a back charge, let me know that you don't agree with the invoice and then we'll address it. You, you have those, those rights, right? Because right. if we screw up, we want to make it good. Absolutely. Um, but we, we've seen so many times where the, the back charge is just used as a way of not paying an invoice because it always turns out to be almost the exact amount that you're, <laughs> right. you're doing. Or some like egregiously inflated, like uh, a clip angle was down three inches. It should have been two and a half. So it's $8,000. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yep. something like that. Um, right. But and, and it's not brought to your attention until the building has a C of O on it, essentially, and right. it and is the, done. Yeah, the point that I wanted to bring up about the service, um, and I'm specifically not saying the name of the service because I want to talk about it dedicatedly in another video, is that we kind of expected at first for there to be pushback from our customers when they were getting all of these kind of preliminary lien notices and stuff like that, but we've seen none of that. Um, and kind of to the contrary, the, especially some of the smaller fabricators have been grateful for it because they know that because we're taking care of our stuff, if they get into a bad way, they can fall back on us because we've got a lien. Well, they're going to have to get paid too. 
um, which of course we can get a direct check and stuff like that. So they don't always get have to be, have to get paid. But an honest fabricator, one who pays their bills, is not going to be scared of a preliminary lien notice. Right. Right. And if they are, you should really be concerned about if you're going to get paid on that job from that fabricator. Right. Because that's almost like the, the automatic next question is they say, well, why are you sending, you know, if they, I, I don't like that you're sending these things out. Why? Do you intend not to pay me? Right. <laughs> right. That's the only worry is that, you know, they intend to not pay you your, your final check later on. And right. if they know that somebody's going to be holding them accountable for that, then if that's a problem, then you probably yeah. don't want to work with them anyway. Right. And the, the message I have at all these conferences, whenever I'm having conversations with detailers is how important it is for every detailer to go and get their money and be really aggressive about collecting their money because we all need it, right? If, if several, if half the detailers in the world are okay, you know, getting screwed, then fabricators are going to get spoiled with that. The, the bad ones are going to go, Oh, well, it's okay for me not to pay. Nothing bad is going to happen where we're trying to teach a freaking object lesson. Like, you know, it's the equivalent of a freaking spanking at the end of it. It's not about the, <laughs> the, 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 it's about, you need to know that your reputation is going to suffer if you don't pay your bills. We are going to tell people you didn't pay your bills and we're going to get our money. And that's the, you know, we've had all sorts of bravado, all sorts of things. In the end, you get the money, right? And, and, and that's it. That's, that's, that's what it's kind of about. So that's, again, you know, we, we had those, but I, I just love those guys from Picker. I can't, I can't remember both their names and I, I had just looked it up because um, you meet so many people and the, the names escape, uh, but they were, it really had I a know, good. I, I have a collection of business cards from everyone I could get them from, but the people that, that went without, <laughs> if I'd only met one or two people, that would have been different. Right. Man. Right. There's, there's, there's so many so popular, popular group that day. Um, well, and that was, that was the, the funny thing. Um, it's the only room in the world where anybody knows who we are. Right. Right. There's, you know, what, 500 people there and about a hundred of them watch our, our videos and we're kind of excited to, to meet us, uh, which was fun. It was, it was, it was great to, to meet some of those people. Um, and also amusing to see some of the ones who, despite our very questionable status, were like nervous to come talk to us. <laughs> right? Like it was. It was like it, we, it's, we had some fans. Yeah, yeah it was nice. You know, um, yeah. we also had some not fans though. Um, you know, particularly. You know, we walked into the the conference to kind of just take some video in in, in the the what's it the exhibition hall. Yep. Yeah, and there were just signs just posted, just everywhere, right? To to not video record, um, which we found I think disappointing. Um, I think a lot of our viewers found it disappointing too that the information there, which is ostensibly for to be shared with the entire user base, was. Um, restricted and you know we had some conversations with with staff kind of about that um and about the kind of the future of social media right and in sds too and that there's there's no way to present uh, a channel that is always exactly what sds2 wants um, as far as public information, but that's coming, right? People are going to share their opinions about software one way or the other. And it's important to us that we be seen and that we're a figure to push SDS forward to, to kind of help them. That's our goal, right? Even when we're complaining, even when we're negative, our goal is to bring about positive change. Right. And, and the only way to accomplish that is to be entirely honest for good or for bad. Right. You, know, right. you have to know what it is you're dealing with so that you can address it. If you can't discuss something in an open and honest manner, then you can't really tackle what are the issues and how do we fix them? Yeah. That's not to say that some of it did not provide me valuable perspective. Um, right. Because, 
we we do have a certain dynamic which is a back and forth where it's it's almost a devil's advocate situation um where you know you'll say something and then i'll challenge it and then you know it we kind of figure out the, the best way. Um, and that's a, a format that we use because we think it's valuable for teaching. Um, and it, it has been in the past, it, it worked as opposed to, you know, when we first started doing videos, it was us trying to read off of a script and, you know, do it almost webinar style. And it doesn't work. It's, it's terrible to watch. It's boring. It's, it's, it's awful. And, you know, a lot of the questions that, that need to get asked don't get asked that way. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's not for lack of a better word, entertaining. Uh, so, so it's not available for us. So, um, you know, that was uh, honestly disappointing for us because we, we look at ourselves as allies of SDS too. Um, and we did not have the, the perception of a, a welcome there or as an ally. Um, we, we did have a conversation with them. So we think that, you know, in the future, we're going to try to, uh, work together. A little bit better um, but it's important for us to, to kind of maintain our I, I, integrity sounds overly grandiose because you know it's not it's not some deeply seated moral whatever it's just that you know I think the users need to hear the, the truth and I think it's a better channel and it's more productive for it to be that way and there are obviously going to be times when SDS2 disagrees with us and that when we're wrong, right? Like there were several times where I said stuff, you know, whether it's on, on video, you know, at my, my session or wherever else where I just say, hey, SDS doesn't do this. And then, you know, somebody from the community or somebody directly from SDS2 corrects me. That's not a bug though. That's a feature, right? When we started the channel, it wasn't because we know everything about SDS2. It's because... Right. It was to have the conversation. Right. And that allows people to, to grow. Right, right. And we're willing to put ourselves out there and look stupid. Particularly me. I am an expert at making myself uh, apparently stupid and, you know, learning from, from that. It's, it's, a, it's a real skill I have. Oh, I like it that you occasionally get behind the curve on SDS because you're a little bit more removed from it. So I get to teach you things here and there. Well, and it's crazy too, because, you know, we will have a, a moment with uh, Bondo is one of our, our, our detailers where something that we've known has worked for a long, long time. Uh, for instance, move, you know, moving materials move without material. members, you know, where if you grab a bunch of materials across several members, you can move all of those materials without selecting the member it, you know prompts you select a member to move them to but if you just return on that and okay so when you run the uh, the tool to move material and it goes to ask you you know which, which member do you want to move this to if you just hit enter instead of picking anything then all of those different materials will stay attached and associated to the members they're already associated with so you can just move them and they all stay where they are and that that kind of blew his mind because you don't really know that's a thing. I mean, it's not right. Not it's something not. you see as an option, you know, right. so you, you think, right. Oh, I have to pick something and now I'm stuck. Now I have to, you know, I can only move one member at a time. Right. And that's one of those things like that in the, the interface should be, you know, it, it's a simple tweak to change the prompt, you know, select the member or return to, you know, leave the members unedited. I don't know, I don't know exactly the language, but something along those lines. Um, but it used to, at least by now, it used to work that you had to select a member. And then at some point they changed it so it would just stay where it was. Uh, but, you know, it's, that's, the, that's the classic example of, yeah, I didn't know you could do this thing. Uh, one of the ones that I had for my session, um, you know, I did a session on SDS2 hacks, um, was, you know, I mentioned, you know, you can't do a, a plate stringer in SDS2. Well, it turns out if you just type in a plate shape under section size, you can use a plate stringer under stairs. I had no idea. It's, it's asking for a shape. Everywhere else, when I need to type a, type a shape, I have to type a shape that, you know, works. A wide phone, right. a channel, et cetera. But in there, you can type, you know, plate, order by 12 or whatever it happens to be, and it makes a stringer out of it. It works, and it was like, but, you know, bringing it to me as a, you were wrong and saying, you know, you were wrong as if that's, something that I'm going to be bothered by. No, I'm 
I love being shown, you know, when I'm wrong. I love it. It's my favorite. Because right, it's a learning can, opportunity. Yeah. Yep. And that that's proven, you know, it was, that was one of the things I had when I was coming up as a detailer, I constantly got into conflict with our checker because he would say, this is wrong. Do it this way. And I would say, you know, I would always say, why is it wrong? It's not, it's not that I don't believe you that it's wrong. It's that I need to know in order to grow. Um, yeah. I, I rhymed it. All right. Fine. I thought it was a good rhyme. I can't quite hear what you're saying there. Okay. I said, I need to know in order to grow. Ooh. All right, fine. <laughs> You're no M&M today, my friend. No, no, I am not. Maybe a Skittle. Um, yeah, see, I am a full-on dad. I've got the full-on dad jokes going. It's, it, it makes me proud. Um, so, you know, one of the things I saw at the conference that I, I really like, I have to give a lot of, respect to the users group or the advisory board, not the users group, uh, was just how long and hard that they were working. Like they were, you know, we're off going to get drinks and good Mexican food and, you know, just having at it with, with people that we're meeting and having our hot tub time and, you know, in and out of all of that, they're just sitting at a table having what seemed like some pretty, pretty serious discussion. Um, yeah, they they were they were in talks the entire day before the conference, I believe. They got there early, or possibly even the day before that, and then they were there right up until dinner. We talked to some of them, and then they said, "Well, you know, we can't go hang out with you guys because we've got to actually go back and have more meetings." So I think they were in meetings until like nine or ten at night that night. Yeah, yeah, and really great, and you know. It, all the all the respect in the world to the people who do that, um, you know, because there's there's not a whole lot of benefit to it. Um, but I think we should talk a little bit more too about our, you know, our perceptions of because we're we're going to go into the sessions themselves uh, deeply. But I wanted to talk about the the one about what's coming up with SDS two, both the the session with Stuart Broom, who is the CEO, and the one with Steph. On, on what's coming up in SDS2 2020. We were about to, we were about to talk about the uh, SDS2 uh, kind of what's coming up and, and, and what's new in 2020. Uh, we mentioned there were kind of two different sessions. There's one with Stuart Broom, who is the, the new, uh, I'm not sure if he's official yet or the still interim CEO of SDS2. Uh, and then there was a separate one, which was SDS2 2020 presentation by Steph Haith. Um, which kind of went over the, the specifics within the software itself. Uh, so I, th I think maybe we should start off with kind of the, the vision for the future that, that Stuart talked about. Yeah. So uh, they're, they're taking, they're taking a, a real hard look internally at the way that they've been doing things and what they need to do in order to get themselves kind of back on the right path. Uh, looking at, what do the customers really need? Where is the industry going? And what have they been doing right and wrong along the way to kind of help move the industry along in the direction it needs to go? And a lot of what they've, what they've come up with as far as the direction of the software is going to be things like getting a, a better release schedule going and having a more stable release. A, a lot of what I was picking up on was a lot to do with the uh, internal testing and how testing is going to be carried on and how these versions are going to be released to us going forward as far as the alpha being entirely internally tested beta is no longer just going to be available testing for uh, you know anyone that kind of wants to do it you're going to have to fill out the nda you're going to have to really uh, commit to, yeah, to you have to, to testing. really commit to testing. It's not just, well, I want the latest version just to see if it fixes the bugs I've got. Right, and you I'll know, run it through what I'm doing anyways. Right. You're, you're going to be dedicated to testing it if that's what you're going to be getting into. Yeah, and I think that's a tough sell. I think they're going to have a hard time getting people to be uncompensated members of their beta program under those restrictions slash requirements, uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? It's just... Um, you know, I don't think people are going to do that work for free. Um, right. I'm, you know. I'm interested to see how they, how they implement that when they fully execute it, you know? Right. 
right? And like for, for us, it's a no-go, right? Like the, the NDA right off the bat is, is kind of, you know, not a big thing for us. Uh, but more importantly, I think, is the, the, the nature of the testing that they want us to do. It's just not something that we're willing to spend time on, um, you know, or like we said, for, for free. Uh, if it was, you know, spend an hour to test this feature for us and then, you know, do whatever you want, that'd be one thing. Uh, but that dedicated, just sit there and test it. I don't think that's going to be. One of the things they mentioned is kind of, retooling their staff and making everybody a part of the, the quality program, um, which I, I'm not really sure kind of what that means as far as uh, testers are testers, right? Like the people who know how to really test software are, uh, it's a subset of a skill. Like a checker is not the same thing as a detailer. Right. Um, and we do what are what we call in process checks in our detailing where you know the next guy up the line is kind of reviewing what the last guy did but that's not the same as a checker so um it doesn't sound like they're adding dedicated testing staff necessarily um but it does sound like they're taking a more serious approach to testing a more focused approach which you know is, is really great one of the things we never really discussed was what do you think brought rise to these changes? I mean, it, that's difficult to say because it's really just going to be speculation, but I think that, I think that the, the existing customer base has been getting more and more vocal, especially over the past couple of years at the, lack of direction that we've been seeing and how things have been kind of going downhill. Yeah. And it, it's been, it, it started out, you know, when, when they went to the annual release, there was, there was a fair bit of pushback on that, but it, you know, it, that's the new direction and okay, you know, we're, we're going to see a steadier release of, of more minor improvements, but over the course of, if you look back three or so years, you should see that, over that time, yes, that was a major overhaul between, say, 2015 and 2018. You should be really noticing a massive difference between those two, as you would between 7.2 and 7.3, or 7.3 in 2015. And it kind of wasn't. You know, it was, it was minor improvements. There were, there were things that they kind of fell down on. And it seems like with the new leadership... Uh, with with Stuart that they've really refocused and they've redirected how they're going to be doing these things so that they're trying to hit these goals on a more consistent basis where we're actually going to see an improvement in the software and, you know, finally listening to the customers. You know, I, I've heard this a million times and, and I've said it myself. If, if you produce another year of software and you don't have any new features, but you fix the bugs I'm excited, you know, that, that's going to get me happy. So I think that shooting for stability and quality of the substance that's already there, as opposed to just trying to get a new sales gimmick crammed in there is going to go a long way for them. Well, you, you touched on what I think was kind of the key word of the conference, the, the impression that a lot of people left with was renewed focus, um, particularly on what it is that SDS2 is great at and that's making detailing software, uh, steel detailing software in particular. Uh, they talked about uh, they're putting a complete hold on the SDS2 concrete module for what, two, two years at least? Two years. Two years yep. on development and anyone with a license at this point. Two years. And two years at this point, anyone with a full license, they can have access to the current concrete model as it stands so they can make use of it if they want to check it out but I, I don't think they were really seeing that go anywhere. So they've decided let's put a pin in this and sit on it for now. Right. And it, you know, that's a good move. The, the concrete module was, as I understood it, not terribly successful. Um, and because it's kind of a, a, a nascent product in a space that's already been claimed uh, by another company. Uh, but also not just the concrete, but also, you know, they focus geographically on the North American market really kind of, again, staying where they've been successful and where they have, you know, a, a strong user base. 
and it really is. I mean, when you look at this market, they, they're very strong in it and it is what they do well. Right. Um, so I, I was pretty happy to hear about that, you know, as far as it started to feel like our, you know, support dollars were going to development of products that we were never going to benefit from. And that feels a little, that, that felt a little bit like a betrayal. Yeah. Uh, and yep. particularly when they, they had originally put parts of the concrete module that were steel detailing scope in the concrete thing. I think maybe at the time it was an effort to bolster sales of the concrete module, uh, but the user base revolted a little bit at that. They were not happy at all. So eventually they kind of backed off of that, uh, which I think might have even further tanked their sales for, for the concrete module. Um, so, I mean, a absolutely good, new, good, good move. Uh, but they also talked a lot about, you know, focus within the software, um, stuff that I'm super happy about. Um, the first and the big one, something that they've, to my knowledge, never actively talked about before, which is the user interface and user experience as a thing in and of itself. Right. Like, right. And that's something that you've had a, you've had an ax to grind with that for years. Yeah. I, I think it's valid, right? Like right. this is, I mean, it, it's just like building yourself a nice office, someplace that you want to work in. Right? We spend our lives inside the software. We'd like that to be an enjoyable experience. You know, something where I'm happy to be in here. I'm not struggling. I'm not pressing OK to 35 dialog boxes that, that don't need to be. Um, and, and improving that user interface and user experience is going to make your, like the customers, a lot happier. Because, you know, I take our employees' mental health fairly seriously, right? Like I want them to enjoy their work. We've, we've all worked in miserable environments and it does not have to be that way. Um, and it's, that, that's a big part of it, but also productivity goes up hu hugely when these things are just designed right. You know, the simple you know, thing of putting the setting dialog box in the place where that setting is actually applied Stuff like that really makes a big, big, big difference on how quickly and efficiently you can use that software. Um, and there's a certain tendency, you know, of, I, th I think people in general, when something gets frustrating, to just take a break from it for a minute, right? Like you get and you're like, oh, man, I got to go into this, this other box and, you know, maybe I'll just check my stocks real quick while I'm, while I'm doing that. <laughs> See if I'm a millionaire and I can quit this stuff yet. Right, right. It's, it's, it's stuff like that where like you have to go look and you have to go do a different thing, maybe go out of the, the model and, and switch that, you know, making that stuff better is, is going to be nice. Um, I hope part of that is, is to improve the, what I call isometric experience so people can actually work in 3D. Uh, you know, nobody who's using SDS2, you know, all, all their demonstrations and stuff like that show them working in isometric views, but nobody does that. Because the point snapping, the, the the visual feedback of what points you're getting to, all that doesn't doesn't work well enough. Um, right. And it, it's difficult to have faith that you've achieved the correct, the exact correct work point. Right. And a lot of that is visual feedback. Things like snapping to you know X, Y, and Z axes. So when you're moving around, you can see that yeah, I'm still on that line, and giving dimensional feedback of how far. And they've made strides in that, but it's still not quite there as far as visual feedback uh, right. as to what you're doing. Right. And some of it I, I find would be hard to even ever be able to get behind. You know, I mean, when, when you see a demonstration, it's always to perfect points, you know, the absolute end point, the absolute midpoint on the center line of the top flange of a beam, something like that. But, you know, how, how do you know that you've got a construction line that's offset two inches in one direction or the other from there? and you're exactly to the point that you want when you're not putting that in and plan. Yeah. And there's some tools that they're going to need to throw in there, right? Like, you know, a snap point that's from, you know, from this existing point, seven feet in this, you know, along this axis to here, um, some stuff like that. And some, you know, visual nodes that you can grab on and manipulate the model without having to issue commands, stuff like that is stuff that I hope to see in there. But more than that, you know, 
stuff like just making it so the information that you need is readily visible and understandable and that you don't have to go digging through dialog boxes. Uh, hopefully the settings get some attention so that we don't have to play our favorite game. Find that setting where you go, you know, digging through uh, the, the fabricator and job setup to try and figure out, you know, how do I change that, you know, pipe lengths in the bill of material are listed in total linear feet instead of one item at a time. Now, if I recall correctly, uh, in 2020, I believe they had a significant condensing of those settings down so that you're not going to four or five different places to set up your shear plates or joists or things like that. I, I think that was a, a conversation point that they had or a bullet point that they had. I don't remember that being mentioned, point. but I'll take you I, I just... I feel like it was discussed and there was a slide or two about it, but you know, not being able to record. Yeah. Yeah. I just did <laughs> kind of put a, a damper on it. So uh, one of the things that they talked about a lot that I don't think we should focus on too much because we're just not very knowledgeable about it is the ABM overhaul. Um, right. The, the one thing I will say is that they did a session on that, which I attended and it was very much, tell us how you want this to work around. They were, they talked a lot about that UI UX. Yeah. Um, how can we make this efficient and effective? And I think that's, that's an indication of good things to come. Um, and then they, they talked <laughs> um, about the .NET API project, uh, which having a .NET API is, is an absolute game changer in ways that, I can't possibly convey in the time we have in this video. Um, there's so many interfaces, so many different products you can bring in and, and make really kind of intuitive programs and, and interchanges. It's really going to make the software a lot more powerful. Um, and those, that, that power becomes, you know, community driven where you've got 10 people working on it. And that's, Again, a big deal. It, parametrics and custom members and components are a big step forward, but having .NET in there where we can start reading and writing using other APIs um, to get that information in and out of there would make the interface look a lot better and be a lot more usable. Right, right. Because, you know, .NET is something that's much more accessible for people to learn or that, you know, they've come up through, especially the, the next kind of generation as they're coming out of high school and, and college, they're going to have that level of programming experience. Whereas specifically knowing Python, I mean, it, I, I went to school for software engineering and never wrote anything in Python. Yeah. And, and it's not we, that Python's a complex language, but getting into it and really making it right. go, that, that gets a little complex. Not that .NET isn't complex, but it's understood by a lot more industry professionals. It's, yeah, as I say, it, it, it's taught to more people. It's taught more broadly to yeah. people you know, that are coming up with any kind of computer science background, yeah. which is more common in schools today. So you know, th that's going to be something that you're going to see more often anyway. That was, th that was the sort of thing that we had in high school. You know, we had the, uh, the Visual C and... Um, visual basic sort of a background. So it kind of morphed into that over time. Whereas, you know, we didn't do a lot with the other programming languages and Python being one of them. Hmm. So tasty. I got to tell you, I don't know if you buy cider from like just the local cideries. I'm not talking hard cider. I'm just talking soft cider. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it turns well, out. I, I would only buy it from a local orchard. I would never get it at a grocery store. Yeah. The grocery store cider is junk. Um, but the, the local cideries all use a UV process to kill off the bacteria. Um, but what it doesn't kill off, which is fantastic, is the naturally occurring yeast that kind of conglomerates on the peel of the apple. If you just take normal cider and you just leave it, you just set it out on your counter at like 70 degrees, it will harden naturally. If you just loosen the cap a little bit, it'll, it'll vent. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think that's the cider going bad, but it's not. It's actually it's just fermenting. It's just a natural fermentation process. Right. And the cider, once, once it gets like just a couple days of that, 
turns into like a sparkling cider with like a, a, a uh, what's the word? I don't want to say sour. That's not right. But anyways, it, it's freaking delicious. It tastes like champagne. Yeah. Mm. And only $5 a gallon champagne. It's, it's amazing. So that's your lesson on naturally occurring yeast in, in cider. All right. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, one of the things they talked about next, the in modeling, material is actually going to start saving those cut and fit operations right to the material. Yes. What a big deal, right? And it's, it's one of those ones that you, you question what took so long. Right, like if it, if it's possible, it seems like we should have done it. Like, you know, you no longer get that thing where oh, I need to shorten up this angle, you know, half inch on the right side, and oh, we're going to regen that material, and now you lost all your copes and bits. That's not right. going to happen anymore. Well, you know, they when they came out with components, and this, you know, this was a few years ago, and they came out with components. It looked like. They really kind of, that was going to be game changing. You know, the, the possibilities that we all saw there were virtually limitless. You know, the, the different things that you could do with that. Sure. And then they just let it die. And I think that's where this new change in direction is going to kind of bolster where we're going with it is, you know, they're, they're looking back at what, what, what were we doing right before? And we need to get back on that path. And I think yeah, that sort of thing, having, having that material operation saved, that's something that it was a logical next step four years ago. And now they're seeing clear to, let's take that step. What, what, what took us so long? Let, let's make this happen. Let's make those next logical steps happen and let's continue to advance the software in a way that's going to be a great value for our customers. And that's, I think that's what really kind of had me excited because honestly, we went into that, we, we went to that conference and, you know, we, we saw the whole no recording thing plastered everywhere. And we were, we were kind of down on that. And, you know, we were really fed up with 2019 got pulled. We weren't going to see anything until 2020. And it, it, we were really set up for a lot of disappointment. Like, why did I spend my money and come out here? And, we got out there, we saw all the new direction, and it really turned us around. And I didn't really think there was any way we were going to come home with a new opinion on things. I thought 100% when we get home, we're just going to have to start tearing people to shreds and let's check out the competition. And we just, this is it. We're, we've made our last payment, time to move on. And it's really difficult to convey how much our opinions were changed while we were there. Right. And it's, the thing is, it's right now, it's, it's optimism, right? right. Cautious and it's, optimism. It's, it's heavily driven. But, and this is, you know, I, I've said it several times throughout the conference to, to, to everybody, and they all agreed, 2020, the January version, is make or break for SDS2. Absolutely. If that software comes out and the same old bugs are there, the same old problems are there, you know, the, the features that we were told about are only half done or not done or not tested or not documented. If all of that, you know, if, if any of those things really kind of happen, it, it's going to be, you know, rats jumping off a sinking ship real, real fast. Right. Um, and that's, you know, you have to give Stuart credit is he's kind of stuck his neck out there, right? Yeah. And to, to, to bolster that optimism, he's made real promises about, okay, we're going to change the, the direction and we're going to do things better, uh, particularly in testing and user interface. And those things have to come to fruition right. or people are going to scream bloody murder. Or it's going to be the end. Right. And we're happy to grant them that chance, right? Like it, we've been talking about that for a long time. Uh, if it takes longer to get it done right the first time, take the time, get it done right. Or don't add the next feature. Don't promise the next feature. Um, just make it work and work right. completely. So it, it's, it, it's dangerous. Yeah, there, there's a lot riding on that. And, you know, we've got two, two months, two months and change 
Yeah. So. Yeah, which means right now, it, it's it seems to me like all of their development should be done. Right it, at this point, I would hope that they're done with development and they're well into testing, and they're really dialing it in. And you know, with with what we were able to see, it does see, it does feel like they've probably got that development well in hand. Right. You know, it, they they were able to show us a lot of things, and a lot of it did seem to work. So you know, it's it it seems like they've got their heads in the game and they're on track and we're going to really be excited when that 2020 hits in January. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like you said, it's, it's, it's going to be a big deal. We're, we're really optimistic for it. Um, but there's, there is, you know, with that optimism comes a little bit of risk of letdown. So uh, another way that they've kind of it feels like stuck their neck out is the only real term I can put on this, but um, it, it's always been a long time thing where, you know, they would never, ever, ever, ever give us a date to expect a release. Not least of all, not a, a hard date, but definitely not even a month. You know, you could never say, all right, in January or February, you, you're going to see this general release. We, we wouldn't see a beta for three, four, five, six months into the year anyway. So, you know, that's another way where they're, they're kind of putting it out there that we're serious about this. In January, you will see a general release and you will see another one mid-year. Now, I'll give them the floating mid-year because that's just kind of a bug fixes and some minor additional development. But, um, you know, so when that falls, it falls. But approximately mid-year is something that you can still kind of hang your hat on to some degree. But you know, you, you would say, all right, well, it's, it's 2019. Where's my general? Well, January, February, March, April, May, you don't have anything yet. So you go six months along, you know, and you don't see anything. So for them to kind of put their necks out and promise that come January, you will have a general release guaranteed. We're going to do it. You know, that that's another bit of commitment on their part that I really like to see that, you know, it gives us something to hold their feet to the fire. And also it's a promise from them to show that level of commitment that they are making that change to get things done for us. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, I really am. I'm, I'm excited about some of the stuff they're talking about. Mostly again, it's not a new feature that I'm excited about. It's an improvement of the existing features, making the interface cleaner uh, and, and retooling that focus and that testing I think is, is a big deal. Uh, I, I don't know how they're going to, improve testing without actually adding staff or, you know, dedicating staff who might have been doing other tasks to that. Um, hopefully some of those jobs that may have been lost in refocusing uh, came back and, you know, maybe some of those people were retooled or whatever else. Right. Um, but, you know, it, it, as long as they're doing those things and actually testing and then documenting their software, it's, it, it's going to be a, a, a great new day. For, for SDS and that was the, the 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 advisory board you know the users everybody was kind of excited about this potential and you know in the past people have been excited about a feature or two that's coming out but not about generally the direction of the, the company so that I think is more exciting than the standard thing so. I think we're coming up on too long for this video. I think we should, uh, we'll, we'll run into another one shortly here. Um, probably the next day or so that we've got to get that recorded. So, um, coming up, we are going to talk more specifically about the sessions that we went to. We'll talk about a couple more of the conversations. Um, I, I do want to mention that we, we did run into some more people. We were kind of really happy to meet them and kind of get to know them. Um, uh, you know, we can't shout out to, to, to all of you, or we could, but, you know, nobody would, would sit here and watch it. But, uh, you know, the, the, those guys from Soils, we really, you know, spent a lot of time with Soils and Structures. Um, right. People at AirCAD, we had some really great conversations with, um, you know, Tinker Steel, Detailing, um, Don Dillard and company. <laughs> Just all across, we, we had a bunch of conversations. One of the conversations I'm most excited about, Bob Bennett. Uh, we talked about a new direction for the NISD or possibly just supplanting the NISD. I got, I got to um, correct you there. James Bennett. James Bennett. Sorry. Bob Bennett is one of our customers. Bob Bennett is one of our customers. You're right. Um, <laughs> so 
Uh, those are conversations we'll be having in the upcoming days uh, about kind of the direction of steel detailing in general. Uh, we are kind of finding our way to, to be able to record these videos again, get them edited. Of course, we went to a conference just like the NAI or AISC conference? NASCC. NASCC. Uh, we went to the conference for a week and then we're buried for a month trying to, to get out from it. So we are just about unburied. So you're going to see some more videos coming up. We look forward to it and we hope we will see you back here. Let's do it.